Welcome to my presentation on the connection between sleep and work performance. My name is Terrence Shenfield and I have been an education coordinator for respiratory therapy for the last 30 years. I'm also the co-owner of a and Respiratory Lectures and I hope you enjoy this presentation. When we think about sleep, sleep is one of the most vital aspects of our life. We need three things in life, maybe more. We need sleep, we need to eat right, and we need to do exercise. If you do all these things in the right proportion, you're going to be in great health. As you know, healthcare workers have weird shifts. We work from 7 in the morning to 7 in the morning. In other words, sometimes we have three shifts, sometimes we have two shifts, 7A to 7P or 7P to 7A. And typically, the people who work the 7P to 7A shift have other responsibilities in life, such as children, such as shopping, such as, you know, taking care of the home. As a result, one of the first things they give up is sleep. But sleep deprivation has a significant impact on performance. For example, decision making. As healthcare workers, we always make decisions that are critical. Also, memory planning. If we have any kind of task to do, sometimes it just escapes us because we're tired. Um, also, people who work different shifts, they call that um, sleep-wake disorder, where you might work one shift from 7A to 7P, and then two weeks later, you might do a 7P to 7A. There's a lot of problems with that, too. So the Cleveland Clinic estimates that between 10 to 40% of shift workers have some kind of sleep disorder. And we really need to understand what this is, and we really need to do something about it. So sit back, and I hope you enjoy this presentation. So today's objectives are to understand your Epworth sleepiness score, which is a test. It's a validated test used to determine how sleepy people are, if they're getting enough sleep, and how you react to it. So I'm going to give you that test, and it's a personal test and uh, something to think about. I'm going to talk about why is sleep important. I mean, you probably know this. I'm going to talk about the consequences of fatigue in the workplace. Being that we're in the medical field, a lot of us actually interact with patient care. We interact with doctors, nurses, and so on. Sometimes a, de a bad decision on our part can really have some significant consequences. I'm going to talk about shift work. You know, we all are doing shift work in healthcare. I did many shift works myself. Um, I'm going to talk about some common sleep disorders. And then mostly important, I'm going to talk about things you can do because you really got to get control of your sleep because you want to get good control of your health. The Institute of Medicine which is a famous organization for publishing some of real significant findings, published a report called The Unmet Public Health Problem. What they described was that many people in America don't realize how important sleep is and as a result are suffering from a host of chronic disorders. Sleep loss and sleep disorders represent an under-recognized public health problem. You really need seven to nine hours of sleep, and this especially impacts healthcare workers. Healthcare workers who work a 7P to 7A shift typically get inadequate sleep. When you have inadequate sleep, there's a whole range of problems that could occur, some health consequences such as hypertension, diabetes, obesity, heart attack, and stroke. All of these conditions have been related to sleep cycle. Remember that your body produces all these hormones when you're supposed to sleep. So when you're supposed to be sleeping and these hormones are produced, it has some kind of physiologic response, and that's where it leads to. Almost all 20% of all serious car injuries are associated with a sleepy driver. Hundreds of billions of dollars are spent each year on direct medical costs and those related to sleep disorders. So sleep deprivation is really a big problem in America, and you really got to address it, especially as a healthcare worker. In the United States, approximately 9 million people do shift work. And when you talk about shift work, it's not just exclusive to healthcare workers. 
There are many other professions in the United States that do shift work, such as police officers, firefighters, pilots, waitresses, truck drivers. So it's not just us who actually suffer from this type of uh, work shift. But as a result of all work in these odd shifts, many of the some chronic diseases that are coming forth with that in all these groups. For example, they have shown that people who do shift work have a glucose metabolism issue. Basically, they're predisposed to diabetes. Also, you got to remember that when you are, your bodily functions in a way where your circadian rhythms, which is a natural sleep rhythm in the body, and how this works is our bodies produce different hormones. And sometimes these hormones are produced at odd times. So for example, when you're up, when you're supposed to be sleeping at two in the morning, these hormones are flooding your system and causing all these kind of physiologic changes, which are not really good. They also have shown some studies that your immune system is weakened with shift changes. For example, people who work shift work are predisposed to infection. Their immunity has gone down. They have problems with their white blood cells and so on. So there's a lot of things going on with shift work. And also from a healthcare worker, probably any kind of worker, when you're up for hours and hours and hours, you're going to have some kind of um, dysfunction in your alertness and your cognitive ability. In other words, when you need to make some critical decisions, you just might be too tired. We all know that if you're going to try to study and read and learn something in the middle of the night, it's really hard. It just doesn't stick. So there's a lot of issues with shift work and we really need to manage if we do happen to work a shift work we really need to be able to manage ourselves effectively to keep as healthy as we can sometimes we just can't change anything about it you know that's our job we got to pay the bills we got to you know we do what we got to do we all been there okay we're going to have a little fun there i'm going to give you a test Trust me, this test is not going to be scored, so the only one that's going to know the score is you. And basically, this test is called the Epsworth Sleepiness Scale. And what this is, is a series of questions that could determine whether you're getting enough sleep. And based upon your score is how you could make some kind of intervention. I like to say that this is a validated tool. So when I say the word validated tool, that means that they use this test on thousands and thousands of people and they found it to be quite accurate. So what I need you to do is get a pen or a pencil, get a piece of paper. There's going to be a series of questions and at the end of those questions, you're going to add up and come up with your score. Based upon your score, you could sort of make an intervention if you need to do something about your, your sleep habits. So kick back no one's going to judge this this is not going to fail you on your ceu so make sure you keep a good score if you're really interested so here we go so what exactly is the epworth sleepiness scale uh back in 1990 it was developed by an australian doctor dr murray johns and he had a sleep clinic in australia and what he did he devised this score or the scale to measure some of his patients and it really turned out to be so successful that many other sleep clinics decided to use this scale and now it's an international scale used in many different places uh, basically you're going to be given um, a score anywhere from 0 to 24 and based upon your score that's how you're going to measure how you are. Uh, basically, just be honest with the test and answer each question the best you can. And this is your own personal test, but it's a very, very good tool to determine your sleepiness level for the day. Okay, you got your pen and paper? Are you ready to roll? Here we go. Here's the first question. Now, the scoring of this question is zero to three so you would put zero if there's no chance of you dozing 
and you would put three if there's a great chance that you're going to dose and then you you know you could use a scale so zero is zero, no chance three is a great chance you're going to dose so first question you're sitting and reading what is the chance of you dozing think about it and put your answer here's your second question same kind of scale the chance of dozing zero to three so you're watching tv what's your chances of dozing again put your score so you're sitting inactive in a public place say for example a movie theater or you went to a meeting what's the chance of you dozing during this meeting or public place what is the chance of this happening to you I am sure we all have been passengers in cars and we all took a long drive in the past so as a passenger not a driver you're a passenger in a car and you're driving for an hour without a break what's the likelihood or the chance of you dozing remember zero to three zero representing no chance three representing guaranteed so you're lying down to rest in the afternoon what's the chance of you dozing i could say for myself i love my siesta in the afternoon I can definitely take a nap in the afternoon and I feel refreshed but don't let my answer influence yours so what's the likelihood of you lying down to rest in the afternoon um, zero to three so you're at lunch you're sitting in your break room and you're talking to someone what's the likelihood if you're sitting and talking to someone that you take a nap in the middle of that zero to three you know it's kind of funny I used to work with a gentleman for years and we sit down and everyone would be talking and he'd be snoozing and snoring right there on the spot I strongly suspect he has some kind of obstructive sleep apnea because uh, he had all the indications of it but this is you can you sit sitting and talking to someone what's the chance of you dozing you're sitting quietly after lunch you had a nice lunch you didn't drink any alcohol because we don't allow alcohol drinking on the job um, so you're sitting quietly after lunch what's the likelihood of you dozing zero to three this is a scary one you're in a car while stopped in traffic and what's the likelihood of you dozing zero to three I'll tell you a little story uh, years ago when I worked night shift I actually worked night shift for three years um, I was going home after a shift and to tell you how dangerously tired I was I almost swerved off the road my eyes were so heavy and I couldn't do it I could imagine if I went to a light and then I was like sort of stuck in at that light for a long time I might have dozed but um, yes it's dangerous so the question to you you're in a car you stopped at the traffic what's the likelihood of you dozing okay we took the test so what you need to do is add up all your numbers right and whatever your total score is my next slide is going to talk about interpretation of that score so take a moment add it up come up with your score and then we'll go to the next slide and tell you what your score is and where you fall into okay so we'll give this about 30 seconds uh, maybe not 30 seconds we'll give this about five more seconds five four three two one you got your score so how do you interpret your scores 
basically if you have a score of anywhere from zero to seven that means you are completely unlikely to have any kind of sleep issue so you are very very normal the funny part is if you have a score from eight to nine then you're just average you're just the average person who has the average amount of daytime sleepiness here's a scary part if your score is anywhere from 10 to 15 then you are more likely to have some kind of sleep disorder and you really should consider doing some kind of intervention about it and we'll talk a little bit more about interventions as we go on but you know if you're in the 10 to 15 range you got to do something about it so now that we all know our score the question is what do you do about it if you are experiencing extra daytime sleepiness that is abnormal based upon the score we just took there are certain interventions you should do and there are certain consequences that will occur if you don't do it so let's uh, learn a little bit more I wanted to share with you a survey that was done on 7,000 nurses now I'm talking about nurses, but you know, nursing and respiratory therapists work similar shifts. We work in the similar areas. So we're probably most likely under similar stress. So they found that nurses who do typically a 12 and a half hour shift, which is actually very common with um, healthcare practitioners such as respiratory therapists, were three times more likely to make some kind of error when they were working. They also said that 80% of them felt tired after work. 55% of them felt tired at work, which is very common. Uh, typically, nurses, just like respiratory therapists, work more than 40 hours a week. And they also found that during a 28-day study that almost all the nurses worked at least one overtime shift. Um, they also said that either two out of three of them actually worked more than 10 or more overtime shifts in 28 days. So the likelihood of working overtime is really high. The likelihood of being really tired is all the time. And these are sometimes the consequences and, uh, of working all these hours. And, you know, in times when we're short, you know, overtime is abundant and we work our butts off and we make some extra money. Let's talk about statistics on medication and other errors in the ICU. Um, they've done some studies where they show that medication errors and other errors are significantly higher after eight hours of work and even higher after 12 hours of work. So the concept here is that the longer you work, the greater likelihood of an accident. So they done some studies where they looked at when do medication errors occur, when do other type of errors occur, and they found that most of the errors occurred in the later part of the shift. More errors occurred as you approach 12 hours and less hours occur when you're less than eight hours. The rate of employee accidents also increases after nine hours of work and doubles after 12 hours. So what they found that they look at previous reports of employee errors and most errors and most accidents that occur with employees, again, happen at the later part of the shift. Uh, one study also shown that critical care nurses who experience fatigue will more likely report what is known as a decision regret. A decision regret could be something they made a decision about something and they regret it because they realize it's wrong so again as we work longer hours as we go into the 12 hour part of our shift we sometimes make decisions that are not the best and it's only human doesn't make us weak just makes us tired let's talk about sleep patterns as a newborn almost 50% of our sleep is in REM. So this is a time where the neural pathways of the brain are sort of making sense to everything. They need several periods of naps. As you know, newborns could sleep hours and hours and hours. So 
And the funny part about that, that's the only time where REM sleep is almost 50% of the sleep. As a child progresses into being a toddler, their sleep pattern emerges a little bit differently. They actually have patterns similar to adults. Um, the funny part is once a person becomes a child, and you know, a child could be anywhere from the ages of eight to 12, um, they need more sleep. And at this point of life, they are actually experiencing tremendous growth. Their bodies are growing, their mind is growing, they have all these neural pathways growing. So they really need some more deep sleep to recover. Um, the funny part about adolescence, as I learned this as I was researching everything, they have a shift in their sleep-wake cycle. So what does that mean is typically adults have a pattern of sleep, which I'm going to show you on the next graph. It's the next slide shows a graph of it. But there's a shift with adolescents. So as teenagers with their sleep pattern, they naturally feel sleepy around 11 o'clock. And the problem with that is they got to get up at 6 o'clock in the morning to go to school. They are just naturally geared to staying up later and getting up later. Yet, you know, society pushes upon them to get up early for school. They got to catch a bus to school. And you, then you tell them at night, yeah, go to bed. It's 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock. You got to get up tomorrow morning early when the natural cycle tells them to go sleep around 11 o'clock. So society should change some of the patterns of education for adolescents. As we move into being an adult, we need a more regular sleep pattern. I mean, the best thing you could do is get yourself into a very regimented time to go to sleep and what time you wake up. I know it sounds boring that you got to be so regimented and keep to a routine, but actually optimum health occurs at this. So as you get older and older adult, many times you have like chronic diseases and sometimes with these chronic diseases, you end up taking some medications. And a lot of times medications disrupt the sleep pattern. So the problem with older adults, and there's many, many older adults in the world, is they sleep less efficiently. And what do I mean by sleep efficiency? Sleep efficiency is the amount of time you spend in bed versus the amount of time you actually sleep. So the older adults, yeah, they could go to bed at nine o'clock at night, but if you count the total amount of time of sleep, they only slept six hours. That means they lie in the bed awake and they can't fall asleep. So they have very poor sleep efficiency. The best sleep efficiency is around over 85%, so that's normal. So, you know, you could just do the calculation. If you go to bed uh, for eight hours and you actually sleep um, six hours, so it's six over eight, and I don't know what that number is, but the magic number you want is you want to have about 85% sleep efficiency. Our sleep is regulated by two body systems. One of them is called the sleep-wake restorative process, and the other one is called the circadian biological clock. These two systems actually promote sleep and actually also promote when we wake up. So the sleep-wake restorative process is a system where the longer we are awake, the greater the drive is to go to sleep. And the flip side to that is the longer we sleep, the greater the drive is to wake up. When we are awake for many, many hours, our body naturally produces a hormone called adenosine. Adenosine is produced by the brain, and when this is produced, it actually increases the sleepiness level. In regard to the circadian rhythm, this regulates um, wakefulness and sleep by light and darkness. So when the sun comes up and hits your eyes and your optic nerve, it gives signals to your brain, and this sort of wakes us up. At the same time, when it becomes dark at night, um, the optic nerve doesn't get much light and actually melatonin is produced at this time and this is a time when you fall asleep. So these two systems work hand in hand with each other. The graph on the right 
represents a graph of thousands and thousands of people. This is a natural circadian rhythm of people. So as you could see, people at nine o'clock in the morning are wide awake, you know, ready to go, able to do anything. And then as the afternoon comes on, especially around between one and 3 p.m., we get a dip. And this dip actually corresponds to a time when many cultures actually do um, siestas. And to tell you the truth, I get really tired between the afternoon. So like, if I could take a nap in the afternoon, I jump on it. Also, after the you know after about 3 p.m., we start waking up again, and we are pretty alert almost to about you know eight to about 10 o'clock at night, and then after midnight we start getting sleepy again. The greatest amount of sleep, the most beneficial sleep, occurs between 2 a.m. and 4 a.m., and then after around 6 a.m. We start waking up again. Now, this graph represents generally what most people feel. Now, I realize some people work at night, and I don't know if this graph changes for them, you know, because actually it impacts their biological clock. So um, that's a special consideration when you think about people who do work night shift. Let's get into a little bit more conversation about the circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm was first postulated by a scientist, Alexander Borbely, in the 1980s. And basically, he came up with the theory that the circadian rhythm is governed by what is known as an internal biological clock. And during this time, what influences this biological clock is sunlight, and darkness, and also the secretion of certain hormones in the body, such as melatonin and adenosine. And they have found that, you know, as the sun hits the optic nerve and works its way into different parts of the brain, certain hormones are produced, such as melatonin and adenosine. And both of these hormones influence sleep. They make you actually feel more sleepy. Um, there are some genetic factors, like some people just don't produce enough of these hormones or they have a um, shift in wake, dark, uh, wake, wake and sleep processes. Um, also, some external factors have a great influence on your sleep. For example, um, if you're going to go to sleep, you should not have any kind of light in your room because, again, the light can influence your circadian rhythm. It can hit your optic nerve. Uh, also, your room should be in a temperature range of anywhere from 62 to 67. That actually showed that a cooler room actually helps you sleep better. And other factors are such as um, if what you eat. You know, if you eat too much right before you go to bed, your stomach will you'll be digesting food rather than actually producing the hormones you need for sleep. And But some foods can actually help you, like um, a, a light, high-protein dish right before you eat is good. Certain drugs you take. Some people are on drug medications, uh, pharmaceutical drug medications for illnesses, and that can influence. As I mentioned before, ambient temperatures, it seems like you could sleep much better. Studies have shown that if your room is cool, and even if you put a blanket on yourself, that can help you. And this, talking about blanket, they did some research where they showed that Sometimes a heavy blanket can actually cradle your body and improve your sleepiness. And actually, they've been, if you go to Google, you'll see so many people selling these sleep blankets. Um, naps, if you take a nap, it's nothing wrong with a nap. But if you take a nap for two hours in the afternoon, uh, you're going to pretty well be, be awake at night. Um, stress can impact you. I mean, um, we all have stress. And the funny part with me is that anytime I'm really stressed, it comes out of my sleep. So I try not to engage in any kind of serious conversation after 7 p.m. Um, sometimes it drives my wife nuts because she wants to talk about some serious stuff. And I'm saying, oh, please, let's talk tomorrow morning. And she works with me. Um, creating a schedule is like really important. So it's not 
what it's not how important what time you go to bed it's what time you wake up so you really got to create a routine for yourself and most people need between seven and nine hours of sleep but i don't care what you say that i could get by with five you're actually hurting yourself you're actually creating a scenario called sleep debt which i'm going to get a little bit more into but creating a schedule even a boring schedule is perfect um so try to go to bed at the same time and try to get up at the same time and um, I used to sometimes not use an alarm clock and the reason I didn't want to use the alarm clock is because I felt the noise would drive me crazy but I found myself waking up naturally early and keep on looking over to see what time it is so this way I'm not late for work so these are some of the things that can impact your circadian rhythm and you really got to learn what's best for you. Everyone is different, but the most important thing is that you get enough sleep and you control certain sleep hygiene procedures that are like no TV in the room, no cell phone in the room, uh, try to keep your room cool and you know, these are all the things that keep you healthy. So we all know that sleep is very important, but the funny part is sleep something that we'll give up before we'll give up that cheeseburger. Um, there are certain things that you need to do in life. You need to exercise, you need to eat right, you need to be emotionally happy, and you also need to sleep. Sleep is so important. So much evidence has shown that lack of sleep can actually impact so many different body systems such as your cognitive ability, your physical ability. It could actually, if you're trying to learn and you're really tired, you won't, you, your memory consolidation won't work. You won't be able to pull facts together that you studied. Um, a good night's sleep could increase your mood. You could have a great mood. You could be wanting to conquer the world. And there have been studies showing that if you don't get enough sleep, it could actually decrease your immune system. So you're more prone to infection. And, you know, we all need to keep strong. Um, other studies showing that if you don't get enough sleep, it's related to diabetes, weight gain, um, so many different areas uh, as a result of not sleeping. So we all know how important sleep is and we all know how we feel when we have a great night's sleep we could conquer the world and so make sleep an important issue in your life make it so that you spend an adequate amount of time sleeping so that you get a great amount of time doing the things you like to do have you ever heard of sleep debt i'm sure you've heard of financial debt and the difference between sleep debt and financial debt is that you could pay back financial debt to zero, where in sleep debt, you can never make it up. Once you're lost, you're lost. Um, studies have shown that the average person needs anywhere from seven to nine hours of sleep. I know so many people say that, oh, I could get by perfectly on five hours, but that's really not the case. Um, they've done studies where they had thousands of people who were in studies and at, they showed that the average person really needs anywhere from seven to nine hours of sleep. And if you don't get it, you get what is known as sleep debt. Um, how you determine how many hours of sleep you need is you have to look at your personal profile. So pick over the last 30 days a night that you fell asleep or a day that you fell asleep if you're a night shift worker and see how many hours it really took of sleep that you felt terrific the next day. And that typically is your hours of sleep you need. They say that only about 25% of the people can actually reach this goal. And like I said, there's no such thing as uh, making up the debt. So if you lose it, you lose it and it has a, a toll on your health. Um, the average American actually sleeps less than seven hours. Um, I'm fortunate, I'm semi-retired. I could get my eight hours of sleep and I feel terrific when I do this. Um, 
37% of all adults say they are so tired during the day that it interferes with daily activities. 75% of adults experience at least one symptom of a sleep disorder a few nights a week or more. And 55% of adults nap at least once during the week. Um, nothing wrong with napping. I'm going to get a little bit more into napping later. But the point I'm trying to say here is that there is a term called sleep that you really can't make up on it. Once it's lost, it's lost. It impacts so many things, like I said in the previous slide. Um, you got to find your magic number. And your magic number, based on studies, is anywhere from seven to nine. I am just like that typical average person. I fall into about eight hours of sleep, and I feel great. I can do anything I want to do. And remember, I do understand that sometimes our work impedes our sleep. In other words, if you work a night shift and you got to get your kids off to school, then you got to go shopping and do all these things that are part of normal life. It's really a problem. Um, I find myself that I can really go to sleep um, rather early at night, but I wake up in the morning early and I'm sort of, that's my cycle. I, that's my best cycle. And I'll get a little bit more into that in the next slide. So how do you make up your sleep debt? And the first thing you need to do is to establish a good routine of sleeping. And you really got to make a solid effort to sort of determine how many hours it does it take for you to sleep and you feeling terrific the next day. And once you find out how many hours you need, you really have to alter your schedule to make it work. Um, create a routine. Actually go to bed. I mean, my personal routine is I go to bed by 9.30 at night. It seems ridiculous. Oh, you know, why the hell would you go to sleep at 9.30 at night? It's because I get up at five in the morning and I feel great. I mean, so I get my eight hours sleep and I go to bed at 9.30. I'm very regimented. And when I'm up at 5.30, I'm ready to conquer the world. Also, you need to develop some good sleep hygiene habits. Sleep hygiene means you don't eat before you go to bed. You don't drink alcohol before you go to bed. You don't have a heated argument with your spouse at, before you go to bed. You know, you try to keep to a routine. And the aim is to actually get up at the same time every day. And you have to allow time, you know, to unwind. So, you know, go to bed, keep the room cool, like I was explaining before, keep the room dark, keep it quiet remove the TV, remove the cell phone. Don't be looking on Facebook, you know, like five minutes before you go to sleep because it just stimulates your mind. And actually the light from the cell phone actually stimulates the circadian rhythm. So you don't want to do that. If you're really, really tired, don't really try to use caffeine to push through. You'd probably be better off to get a good night's sleep. You're really tired because you didn't get enough sleep the night before. So, you know, and also exercise is really important. So if you want to exercise, exercise like two hours before you go to bed, because um, they say a good amount of exercise actually improves your sleep. It actually burns up that extra energy you have in your body. So how do you erase sleep debt? You make sure you have a routine that gives you the adequate amount of sleep you need to survive. So I have a question for you. Are naps good for you? And the answer is yes, they are very good for you. A nap is going to sleep anywhere from 15 to 90 minutes. And studies have shown that after a nap, you actually, your brain function works better, your memory is better, your focus better, your creativity is better and actually your physical endurance is better. Sometimes you just need a nap, 30 minutes in the afternoon, if you could sneak it, get that nap in, and you'll find that you're a little bit recharged for the evening. Um, some people can take what they call a power nap, and some people really restore their energy uh, by taking a nap. The flip side to a nap is if you take a nap too long, 
it's going to impact your normal sleep. Because remember, you have to have a boring routine of going to bed at the same time, getting up at the same time. When I call that boring, it's only a play in words because actually you'll be supercharged all day if you have a proper amount of sleep. So naps are good. Just learn how to pick how much time it takes you to fall asleep and wake up so that you don't end up being up all night. I thought I'd throw a fun slide in. There's a theory, and you could Google it. It's called the ego depletion theory. And actually, it it's applies to managers and supervisors who work night shift. And typically, managers and supervisors, just like you and I, sometimes don't get a good night's sleep. And sometimes this lack of sleep results in sometimes abusive behavior to staff. And they found studies with this ego depletion theory with sleep that people who are in a management position who make decisions uh, are increased risk for impulsive desires, poor attentional capacity, and compromised decision making. So what I'm saying is the ego depletion theory with managers and supervisors who work nights, and you could actually apply this to us, is that they sometimes make decisions that are not the best because of being tired. You know, you have a lack of sleep, you're overly tired, and sometimes you can make some quick decisions that are not the best for you or the patient or the staff. I am sure you all have heard of sleep hygiene. One of the basics of sleep is besides creating a routine that gets you to bed at a certain time and get you up every day, you need to create a routine that's lasting. So sleep hygiene is certain things, certain interventions you could do, and they're non-pharmacologic, they're not a drug, and basically you create a routine of going to bed and waking up at the same time. You make sure that your bedroom is dark, quiet, relaxing, and also temperature. Many studies I have read have shown that the optimum te temperature to be in your bedroom is anywhere from 62 to 67 at night. Some people may say, oh, that's freaking cold. But the idea is you use a nice comforter on you. So you have this comforter on you, which is sort of a heavy blanket. You keep the room cool and you'll actually sleep better. Many studies have shown this really works. Um, you really have to not get involved with electronic devices like TVs, computers, smartphones. Uh, you know, the worst thing you could do is actually sit in your bed, lie in the bed, turn the lights out and, you know, charge up your iPhone. Because um, again, like I told you, the iPhone actually stimulates the optic nerve, which again stimulates the, um, the brain and your uh, circadian rhythm. Um, avoid eating large meals, avoid coffee, avoid alcohol before bed. You know, it's, um, you know, sometimes you say, I'm going to have a couple of shots before I go to bed, so help me sleep. But that's not really the case. Studies have shown that alcohol actually impedes your sleep. So yeah, you could fall asleep maybe quicker, but you're going to wake up two hours later and you're not going to have a full night of sleep or oh, it's going to be really awful so um also exercise is really important and if you get if you keep yourself physically active like two hours before going to bed it sort of burns up that pent energy you have and helps you sleep better so all of these things are called sleep hygiene and they all improve the quality of your sleep and i think we all should follow it in summary recognize what sleep is and how important it is. Recognize if you have any sleep debt, and we all know what sleep debt is. Understand the natural sleep rhythms of your body. Listen to yourself. If you feel tired in the afternoon, take a short nap. If you feel sleepy at night, don't push yourself up to watch the 11 o'clock news. If you work night shift, try to alter your schedule that you can still work night shift, but you at least get seven to nine hours of sleep. 
and also good sleep hygiene. You need to, <clears throat> excuse me, you need to get your room in order so that you do all these things. And recognize that sleep debt cannot be made up. You know, once you lose it, you lose it, and it's going to impact your health. So you really got to do things that improve your health. Thank you very much for joining me for my lecture on sleep disorders. And if you're interested in some resources that would, you could work with, um, these four resources are great if you want to understand how sleep impacts leaders, how it impacts you, how it impacts your health, and how it actually impacts your working environment when you work and make some critical decisions. And I want to thank you very much for joining me.